everyone. <laughs> On behalf of the Lexington Veterans Association, we extend a warm welcome to you for our program on the Battle of Newmarket, presented by Keith Gibson, Executive Director of the Virginia Military Institute <coughs> Museum System. And here to introduce our speaker is Jim Wood, member of our Executive Committee and proud 1959 graduate of the Virginia Military Institute. Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone who's uh, graduated from VMI, uh, the cadets always refer to us as the old corps. So as a class of 59, I really am the old corps. And uh, our speaker today, Keith Gibson, uh, class of 77, <coughs> Mary Youngster, and, uh, but it's a pleasure to have him. I'm really excited to be able to introduce him. And we have a bonus. His wife, Pat, was able to travel with him this time. Pat, stand up. <laughs> he brought along some uh, brochures, which uh, hopefully your grandchildren or your personal interest might. This is a brochure on the ROT, ROTC at BMI the uh, Army, uh, Air Force, Marines, and the uh, Navy. This one is on the academic overview at VMI. <coughs> and the third is life at the Institute. And again, it may well be better suited for your grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Keith E. Gibson is Executive Director of the VMI Museum System and Architectural Historian for the Virginia Military Institute. As Director of Museum Programs, Colonel Gibson is responsible for the operation and development of the VMI Museum and the Stonewall Jackson House, both in Lexington, Virginia, and the Newmarket Battlefield State Historical Park in Newmarket, Virginia. Uh, to our VMI Museum, a uh, Henry Stewart, class of 35, donated his uh, weapons collection, which was 1,000 weapons, 500 of which are on display, which is a great addition. So if you get through there and have an interest in, in uh, weapons, this, these are 1836 to 1864, the start of the uh, revolving cylinder type. Uh, Colonel. Gibson, growing up near Richmond, Virginia, on land hotly contested during the Civil War, kindled his interest in history at an early age. Colonel Gibson received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the VMI in 1977, graduate work at George Washington University and James Madison University helped prepare him for a career in public history. Colonel Gibson's recent published works include Virginia Military Institute, Photographic History, and Moses Ezekiel, Civil War Soldier, Renowned Sculptor. He has worked as a consultant on a number of documentary films made for television films and feature films, including the 2014 feature film on the Battle of Newmarket, Field of Lost Shoes. He appears frequently as a spokesperson for historic <coughs> preservation on radio and public broadcasting television programs. He was instrumental in the development of the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields National Historic District and Commission Act passed by Congress in 1996. In 2012, Colonel Gibson was awarded the Governor's Agency States as the Commonwealth of Virginia Outstanding <coughs> State Employee of the Year. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Keith Gibson. I do hope you pick up these things, uh, because if you do, I won't have to <coughs> pick them up and give them to you. But it, it's a really good general information about the Institute in here uh, the, uh, that you might find of interest. I, I, what are, 
what a true honor it is to be among you in this place. What a combination. American citizen soldiers here in the very place where that shot still echoes, just a few feet away from us. That's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing privilege for someone like myself and Pat to be here uh, to experience that. There's a spiritual connection between you and what I will speak of and this place and where I will speak of. But I never will, I never will tire of saying thank you to you gentlemen and to you ladies that have worn the uniform in your own time. Uh, and even if you didn't wear the uniform, you were waiting, you were there, you shared that experience of sacrifice. So it's a combined effort that the citizen soldier, a combined commitment that the citizen soldier has made to, to this opportunity we even have today. I would not be here if it were not for the, the way you have paved. And certainly the way those 80 militiamen out there paved some over 200 years ago. I uh, uh, provided you a, uh, a map of the battle which I ostensibly am here to speak on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about every one of these units. Uh, and in fact, I mean, but you can't talk about a battle without having a map. You've got to have some place to start. Uh, so this is really for your reference. I won't be alluding to it very often, but uh, there it is. I would prefer, instead of talking about all of those little units that populate this map and where they were at any particular given time, I want to focus on out of that 15,000, I want to focus on about five of them, maybe six. Six that emphasize this, this experience that warfare is, that battle is, the experience, the human nature of the experience represented in these lives that, that I want to share with you. At VMI, a pretty historical college, I hope to, uh, I hope to present to you the evidence. Uh, it's one of the most historic uh, colleges in America. Uh, at the Institute, I wonder if my battery just went dead. <laughs> well, there's a little green light. That's a good thing. <laughs> Let's see. There. At VMI, uh, You'll hear me repeat a couple of times, the nation's first and the oldest state-sponsored military college. It was never a high school, never an academy, never, a, it's always been a four-year undergraduate degree. So it remains today. Fourteen different degree majors are possible from the Institute. Uh, 1,700 cadets from uh, 48 states. Uh, including uh, the, 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 the Massachusetts. There are 22 cadets from uh, the state of Massachusetts in the Corps currently, uh, but others come from around the world. Exchange students from other military colleges and other nations uh, all share the cadet experience at VMI. But we have three museums in our system, which I am uh, honored to be the head of. The oldest public museum in the Commonwealth of Virginia a pretty historic place, right up there with Massachusetts, you know, Jamestown and all that. Uh, the oldest public museum, however, is located on our campus, a post, as we still refer to it today. Founded in 1845. Why would that have been so important? VMI personally hardly had any history. We'd only been around for six years. Why was it so important? Well, I will, I will suggest to you it's important because of what happened out there what happened on that green right out there. That's why it became important for VMI to have a museum. In fact, to have a Virginia Military Institute at all. We operate a historic house museum where Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Major Jackson, uh, was a professor at the Institute and lived here with his bride in 1858 through until he's called away to war in 1861. So the house interprets that period of time an American, an average American family on the eve of civil war, what that experience might have been like. And the Virginia Museum of the Civil War, we operate the official state facility of study of the war, uh, located at Newmarket Battlefield State Historical Park, all in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Uh, 
uh, for reasons I will make clear over the next few minutes. You know, this past fall, nearly three million, three million wide-eyed college freshmen arrived at over 5,000 college campuses across America. And every one of them, you can be sure, had uh, a typical uh, uh, and familiar experience. They participated in some sort of college orientation. Maybe it was an upperclassman showing them where the dining hall was, or the gymnasium, or uh, uh, how to get to the library, or what is the best local drinking establishment. All those critical things a college freshman needs to know. Late in August, the Virginia Military Institute welcomed a group of college freshmen, 519 new cadets, uh, rats as we refer to them in the VMI parlance, very lovingly and caring. Uh, <laughs> they, they have their own college orientation, but it would be a very different experience. The first two weeks of life in the barracks is a whirlwind transformation from high school senior to VMI cadet. Uniforms are issued, hair cuts administered, classes on rifle manual, marching, instruction on the revered honor system, and introduction to the history and traditions of the nation's oldest and first state-sponsored military college. If you had wanted to go to a public college in Virginia in the 1850s, 1860s, you had two choices. One was Mr. Jefferson's school over in Charlottesville, the University of Virginia, and the other was the Virginia Military Institute. Just two weeks after this initial training, these in their new life as VMI cadets, the entire class is loaded on a caravan of buses and routed 80 miles down up Interstate 81, right through the center of the Shenandoah Valley, to the Virginia Museum of the Civil War at Newmarket Battlefield State Historical Park. Here they are introduced to a, a seminal moment in American history, an event in which their forebearers played a key role. These new cadets spend the morning visiting key locations on the battlefield. They visit the museum. <coughs> they receive demonstrations on 19th century tactics. They stand at a split rail fence and hear a dramatic story of what happened here 155 years ago. Late in the morning, they'll form up around Jacob and Sarah Bushong's home and take their cadet oath of allegiance as proud family and friends look on. Then they line up along that same split rail fence in preparation for a ceremonial charge across the field in front of them. This recreation of the charge led by the VMI cadet ancestors is symbolic of the challenges that await them in the VMI barracks to be sure, in the classrooms, absolutely. Indeed, the challenges that await them in life itself. This is one of their first experiences as cadets, as members of a group who, with whom they will learn perseverance, determination, commitment, integrity. Character development is fundamental to four years of being a cadet. Why then do we make such an effort to tell the new cadets this story, indeed to have them experience this story? The answer is found in the events of a rainy Sunday afternoon in 1864. That afternoon, it was reported to be the worst thunderstorms on record. Rain saturated the ground from a week of downpours, but on Sunday afternoon, the 15th of May, the storm released all of its fury. The heavens seemed to mimic the human storm that raged across Jacob Bushong's farm as Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers battled for possession of what by then had been not become known as the breadbasket of the Confederacy for its rich agricultural resources. Kneeling in the scant protection of a split rail fence, the VMI cadets peered out across a wheat field towards an oncoming enemy regiment. They couldn't make out 
at this point who that regiment was, but they knew pretty certain they were the enemy. They were firing at them. Black powder smoke, low clouds, and pelting rain obscured the view. Several cadets had already fallen from the ranks. As far as their parents knew, however, the cadets were still safely tucked away in their classrooms, 80 miles to the south in Lexington, Virginia. <coughs> the village of Lexington was established in 1778, and it is, I proudly tell you, the first of many American towns to adopt the name of that Massachusetts community, of which you might be familiar, <laughs> of Revolutionary War fame. The very first of all of those Lexingtons that now are speckling the, 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 the continent. Lexington, Virginia picks up that opportunity first. In 1816, the Commonwealth of Virginia opened an arsenal on the outskirts of the village. For, two do for the two dozen militia soldiers stationed there, boredom turns out to be their greatest enemy. And in 1839, the General Assembly decided to occupy the soldiers' idle hours by providing them with a college education. <coughs> Cadets attended classes and provided security at the same time for the arsenal. And in so doing, VMI became the nation's first state-sponsored military college. Upon graduation, alumni returned to their hometowns, more productive citizens. The education of citizen soldiers then was the founding mission of VMI, and so it remains today. With the coming of war, the normal engineering curriculum took a more decided military flavor. The Corps of Cadets longed for the opportunity to prove themselves. Many cadets rode home threatening their parents to give permission to leave the institute so that they might join the army in the field. And if the parents didn't give that permission, the cadet might be compelled to make himself so undesirable that VMI would have to dismiss him. No. Parents, I, don't, I think that could have been Jim Wood's uh, situation, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> parents, <coughs> parents, though, understandably, for all of those of us who have been parents, uh, hoped to keep their sons at VMI as long as possible, perhaps until the war was over. Civil War disrupted the Union in 1861, as you know. VMI alumni rushed to the ranks of their native state. Of the roughly 2,000 alum living alumni at that time, over 1,800 would serve in the Confederate forces. 19, by the way, would serve in the Union forces, one in charge of all of the defenses of Washington, D.C. Full disclosure, one of them served on both sides. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, depending on what the news headline was, I think, of the day, how he determined who he was rooting Equal for. Equal opportunity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when active campaigning returned in the spring of 1864, Union General Franz Siegel moved his force of 10,000 strong, slowly but confidently, into the Shenandoah Valley. Young recruits from the state of Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and the new state of West Virginia, carved from the Old Dominion, formed the ranks of Siegel's army. Now, Siegel himself had come to America in 1852, following the German civil disturbances there in the late 1840s. He was highly educated uh, at the finest German military schools. But he comes to America and he settles in St. Louis before the war. In fact, he is the superintendent of public education in that city. <clears throat> Perhaps it's, I, I, think, I think I can say that he was the second best known German in the United States at that time. And accordingly was given a political appointment as Brigadier General to show the German immigrants that they would have native-born leadership among the ranks in the Union Army. In the spring of 1864, Ulysses Grant planned to conduct an aggressive offensive against Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia on the eastern part of the state, uh, Fredericksburg, Richmond, that part of the Commonwealth. Between May and June, in fact, Grant would wage a war of attrition against Lee in a series of battles in places that many of you have visited. The Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, Yellow Tavern, Cold Harbor. Grant promoted Siegel to command the army destined to invade the Shenandoah Valley 
in the western part of the state. When government officials in Washington voiced their concern about Siegel's abilities to command an army, Grant responded that he only expected Siegel to hold a leg while Grant would do the skinning in the eastern part of the state. Didn't really expect much, just to, maybe a diversion is what Siegel's uh, job would be. Confederate General John C. Breckinridge responded to Siegel's movement by rushing his small army of 5,000 Virginians and I must, uh, again, full disclosure, tell you that there was about 60 guys from Missouri with all of those Virginians uh, there as well. They make their march towards this, uh, uh, this, uh, this Union Army. See, uh, Breckinridge was a popular Kentucky politician. In fact, he had served as Vice President of the United States under James Buchanan just before the war. Indeed, he ran for president in 1860 on the Democrat ticket and almost won, but loses out to his, the husband of his cousin. John Breckinridge's cousin was Mary Todd Lincoln. Mary Todd Lincoln's husband was Abraham Lincoln. By the spring of 1864, the former vice president was commanding the awkwardly named Department of East Tennessee and West Virginia way down in Southside Virginia, way down in, in, well, part of the map you can't even see here. And he has to make this dashing rush northward down the valley uh, to intercept that Union Army that is on its way into the valley. As Breckenridge's army passes through Lexington, comma, Virginia, on, uh, their, on its way north to repulse Siegel's army, he asks for the service of the 250-member VMI Cadet Corps to bolster his meager ranks. Knowing that some of the cadets were, well, all the cadets were untried on the battlefield, and that their average age was just barely 17, some of the cadets had just turned 15. Breckenridge told the VMI superintendent, uh, the, the president of, of VMI, uh, Francis Smith, I don't intend to expose them to battle. Breckenridge explained that the cadets would be assigned to picket duty or as baggage train guards so that the season veterans could be released in order to fight. Orders came for the cadets to join Breckenridge on the evening of 11 May. The cadets were ecstatic, as you might imagine. Here, at last, was their opportunity to prove their worth as real soldiers. Among these jubilant youth were cadets Moses Ezekiel and Thomas Jefferson. Now, Ezekiel and Jefferson had become especially close friends in the barracks at VMI. Ezekiel, the first Jewish cadet to attend the institute, knew that it was Tom Jefferson's great-granduncle, President Thomas Jefferson, who had written the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, a very important document in the Jewish household of Moses Ezekiel. Over the next four days, the cadets and the Confederate Army would cover 80 miles, marching in the rain, sleeping on the ground. Several cadets found drier accommodations on the night of the 14th by sleeping in the pews of the Mount Tabor Brethren Church. Their slumber was interrupted about 1 a.m. in a quintessential example of the Army's uh, uh, well-known trait of hurry up and wait. They were roused from the bed at 1 a.m. and ordered to form up immediately. And so they went out into the Valley Pike and stood for a couple of hours waiting to march. But Breckenridge had received word that Siegel's army was in the town of Newmarket, just seven miles to the north. It was now clear where these two great armies would clash. Now, I mentioned the Massachusetts Regiment that was with Siegel's command. It was the 34th Massachusetts Infantry. It was formed up just a matter of some 50 miles to the west in Worcester? <laughs> Worcester, Worcester. I knew, I knew some of you would know how to pronounce it. <laughs> but there, there, they were, there they were formed up in the summer of 1862, but they drew members from all over Massachusetts, every part of the state. 20-year-old Ensign M. Smith, Ensign, by the way, for you Navy types, was his name, not his rank. 
from the western village of Dalton in the Berkshire Hills joined the regiment on the 31st of July. He had a hard time explaining to his fiance Lucy why he why it was so important for him to make that commitment to join these bunch of fellows that he had never met before in this town and march off to who knows where to preserve the Union he told Lucy. His enlistment papers documented Smith as being five foot six inches tall and a woodsman by trade. By August, Smith and the regiment were in Alexandria, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C., under the command of Harvard-educated Colonel George D. Wells. The regiment spent most of the next two years actually uh, in garrison duty around Washington, drilling, marching, camping, and finding time for the occasional social event. <laughs> in the spring of 18 of 64, they became part of Siegel's 2nd Brigade, 1st Infantry Division, and headed south into the agricultural cornucopia of the Shenandoah Valley. You know, I can't help but to imagine that the farmers in the ranks of the 34th surely must have appreciated that rich agricultural countryside as they moved south down the Great Valley Pike. By Friday, the 13th of May, Siegel's advance units under Colonel Augustus Moore had established an east-west line right through the town of Newmarket. They held the important road leading up and over the Massanutten Mountain, just about three miles off to the east. That important road was an opportunity and a connection with Robert E. Lee's army about 40 miles beyond. So it has a, it has a, a strategic uh, importance in the Union Army held that position. Now, if Siegel's given the chance, he might take advantage to go through that gap across the mountain and t attack the flank of Robert E. Lee while Grant is hitting the front of Lee. It's a possibility. It's, it's, it's something that General Breckinridge, the Confederate commander, did not wish to consider. On Sunday morning, Colonel Moore waited for the rest of the Yankee army to join him in Newmarket. Siegel had allowed his forces, however, to become strung out over about 10 miles of the Valley Pike. Moore second-guessed his position and choose, chose to drop further back, northward, about a mile north of town, in fact, where his small force could more safely await the rest of his army. And where Moore could defend his position alone if the Confederates arrived first. Moore's new position struck a line east-west across the fertile wheat fields of Jacob Bushong's farm. At dawn, Breckinridge's forces topped Shirley's Hill just south of the town of Newmarket. Artillery fire announced their arrival. Gray-clad soldiers began the slow and determined push towards the position held by Moore. The cadets, however, were safely tucked into the reserve ranks, just as General Breckinridge intended. No harm could come to them there. Around noon, Franz Siegel and most of his army arrived to bolster Moore's well-selected position. By 2 p.m., the Confederates stood just 900 feet short of an 18 Union artillery pieces set hub to hub and blasting away with anti-personnel canister across that wheat field. Behind the artillery waited three fresh Union regiments. The Union artillery was masterfully handled with devastating effect at such close range. The 51st Virginia and the 62nd Virginia briefly paused behind the split rail fence that separated Jacob Bushong's orchard from his wheat field. The center of the Confederate line where those two regiments met was literally cut away as if wheat before the scythe. Breckinridge watched as the center of his line simply ceased to exist. You must send in the reserves, the commanding general's staff declared. Breckinridge uh, resisted, but then he realized that the reserves must be ordered into action or he must withdraw from the field and conclude defeat. This meant sending in the cadets to repair that dangerous gap in the center of the Confederate position. Breckinridge acknowledged 
to the movement and said, send in the cadets and may God forgive me for that order. The gap in Breckenridge's line did not go undetected by Union General Franz Siegel. The German-born immigrant quickly ordered his infantry to charge into that breach at the fence line. In a moment of excitement, seeing this opportunity in front of him, Siegel reverts into his native tongue of German, thus confusing the commanders of his three awaiting <laughs> commanding generals, his, his colonels, the, 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 the commander of the 54th, the 1st West Virginia, and the 34th Massachusetts, even the Harvard-educated George D. Wells, saying, what the heck is he talking about? Uh. Well, so the consequences of that, not being sure of what it was that Siegel was asking them to do, the 1st West Virginia lurches forward, but then sort of rethinks the whole situation and quickly falls back to the safety behind the Union artillery. The 54th Pennsylvania became entangled with the left flank of the Confederate 62nd and couldn't move forward. They were just stopped. Alone, Colonel Wells commanded his Bay State Regiment forward. Meanwhile, the cadets received orders to move up and take a place along that split rail fence now splattered by the blood of the 51st and the 62nd Virginia. 250 cadets moved forward over the mangled and wounded and dead of those who moments earlier had held that critical position. The cadets reached the fence in short order. Moses Ezekiel was in Company C. Jefferson stood just a few feet east in Company B. Several cadets fell from the ranks, some wounded, others dead. Close up, dress right, came the orders. Here the cadets waited. They fired their imported Austrian muskets into the field to their front, but they could only see a few dozen yards into the black powder smoke and the cloud-covered wheat. An enemy regiment could barely be seen moving towards the fence and towards the cadets. Then, through the smoke, came this regiment undeterred and their great red, white, and blue flag declared the regiment to be the 34th Massachusetts Infantry. For a brief moment on that battlefield, young men from the Bay State Farms stood across just yards away from the Virginia Military Institute College boys. As the 34th neared that split rail fence behind which the cadets waited, <laughs> That, was, that Bay State Regiment received the withering, concentrated musket fire of the entire Confederate line. The 34th found themselves completely alone in this field of death. In a matter of minutes, 215 of the original 500 members of the regiment were killed, wounded, or simply were not accounted for. Just to the right of the flag, Corporal Ensign Smith marches steadily forward. Raging artillery and cracking muskets combined with a natural storm overhead made it impossible for Colonel Wells to be heard by the men of the 34th. But on they marched toward the flames of the Confederate muskets and the cadets waiting by that split rail fence. Desperate to save the regiment from total destruction, Colonel Wells physically has to grab his color bearer and turn him towards the safety of the rear you know that there's a song, rally around the flag, or rally around the flags, boy, rally around the flag. As goes the flag, so goes the regiment. Corporal Smith saw what was happening. He saw the flag falling back, and he falls back with his comrades. But then suddenly, he feels a sharp pain in his left foot, and he collapses into the wet wheat. In an instant, the moment of the battle had shifted to the benefit of the Confederates. As the Union line faltered, the Confederates rose from behind the fence and raced over the ground just moments earlier held by the 34th. Ensign Smith watched helplessly his regiment fall back. Then he feels the sting of a second musket ball. This bullet pierces his upper chest and passes through his left lung and exits in the small of his back. The gray wave passes over Smith with death near his thoughts likely turned back to the Berkshire Hills and his family there. Certain he would never see them again, or Lucy, that he had to so diligently explain why he was making this commitment. 
would be waiting for him. He would not see them again. Ensign crawled into a shallow, muddy ravine for the safety that it might provide his last hours. The cadets stormed across the field towards a Union artillery battery and captured one of its guns. Cadet Oliver Perry Evans, the color barrier of the cadets, climbs up on the gun and proudly waves the, 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 the cadet corps flag back and forth. The muddy wheat field that they are running across sucks off the boots from the cadets and the other soldiers as they ran forward, giving rise to the name that that field still carries to this very day, the field of lost shoes. Remnants of the 34th, including Lieutenant Colonel William Lincoln, attempted to protect the guns as the cadets swarmed around in hand-to-hand -hand combat briefly, but furiously, Cadet Hannah bayoneted Lieutenant Colonel Williams and took him prisoner. Lincoln would survive, and he presented his field glasses to Confederate General John Imboden for assisting in his recovery and his ultimate exchange. Imboden ultimately gives those glasses to, to our museum, one of the many items that we have related to, to the battle. Now, Siegel saw this disaster unfolding, and he ordered a, a general retreat to the north. Adrenaline and expectant victory pushed Breckinridge's exhausted troops forward. The Union commander raced to cross the Valley Turnpike Bridge in order to put the rain-swollen Shenandoah River between him and the Confederates. Once safely across, the bridge would be burned. Now, this idea of uh, Breckinridge retreating is Colonel Wells writes after the battle. I, I didn't understand why was that necessary. We could have we could have stopped the Confederate advance. Why was it necessary? It really was a part. We were talking about this at lunch today. It was a part of Siegel's military preparation back in Germany. It was a part of German tactics of the time. It was perfectly acceptable to withdraw if you felt things weren't going well. If you had lost kind of control over the moment. You withdraw your troops off the field, you reorganize, and you fight again that day or some other day. But to American officers, to American command, that wasn't a part of the, of the doctrine. And they didn't appreciate Siegel's willingness to abandon the field so quickly. Well, Breckenridge was jubilant with his lopsided victory this victory of 5,000 troops against about 8,000 Union troops. He sought out the VMI cadets in particular. Well done, Virginians, he proclaimed. And then he adds something that was far more important to those young boys, really, from VMI. Well done, men. The cadets had performed beyond anyone's expectation, perhaps even their own. <coughs> Never before or since in American history has a college student body participated in pitched combat as an independent unit and achieved victory. It's a singular moment in American history with God's willing not to be ever repeated. The cost of the experience, though, would soon be realized. Quiet fell over the Bushong farm as evening came. Every home in that small village of 700 residents was becoming a hospital. The cadet corps assembled for roll call. Over 50 cadets did not respond. It would prove some were dead on the battlefield. Others, some 47, were wounded. Several injured cadets had already been taken to the home of the Kleindings family in the village. Not able to find his friend, Tom Jefferson, Moses Ezekiel returned to the battlefield, expecting the worst, as you would imagine. He found Tom, in fact, alive, but severely wounded in the chest. <clears throat> Using a small cart, Ezekiel carried Tom to the Kleindings house. Aid provided the suffering VMI cadets by the 26-year-old Eliza Kleindings, the daughter of the family, created a lifelong friendship and earned her the endearing moniker from the Cadet Corps, mother of the Newmarket Cadets. On Monday morning, the VMI post surgeon took Ezekiel aside and explained that Tom's wounds were mortal. All that could be done was to make him 
as comfortable as possible. Moses began a vigil over his dying young friend, reacting to every movement, alerting to every utterance. By late Monday, Tom was becoming disoriented. On Tuesday evening, Tom loudly stated that the dark room was frightening and that a candle should be struck. In fact, the room was already illuminated with several lanterns, and Moses realized the end was coming near. Then Tom did an interesting thing. He, he, he revives, and he looks towards his good friend and asks, will you read to me from the New Testament? Will you read to me from the New Testament, my Jewish friend? John 14, 2. He cradled Tom in his arms, and this Jewish cadet dutifully read to his Gentile friend, in my father's house there are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. Moments later, Cadet Jefferson dies. Moses washed the body and clipped a lock of hair for Tom's mother and arranged the burial of Thomas Jefferson in the local Lutheran cemetery. Ensign Smith spent the night, Sunday night after the battle, he spent alone. Monday morning comes, the sun rises over the Massanutten Mountain, and Ensign opens his eyes. Still alive, he must have wondered. Still alive. The rain had slacked, but the sky remained dark and threatening. Alone, Smith waited, waited, <coughs> waited for a comrade, waited for the mercy of death. He's there, waiting. Alone there on the battlefield, the sun traveled its arc across the sky and set behind the mountains to the west. Before dawn on Tuesday, and this is over 30 hours after he had received what seemed like a mortal wound for sure, over 30 hours later, Newmarket resident Solomon Rupert found Ensign there in his little muddy ravine. Having no way to move the wounded soldier, Rupert instead built a small little fire and told Ensign, I'll return for you. Can you imagine what a boost that little fire must have been to Ensign? The embers were still glowing when Rupert returned with a small wagon. Solomon took Ensign to his house where his wife, Jessie, was already nursing a house full of wounded Union soldiers. No Confederates to be found in this house. The battle, by the way, had been fought on Jesse's 33rd birthday. May the 15th was Jesse's birthday. Now, everyone in Newmarket knew Jesse Rupert. She was the woman that ran the female academy in town. <coughs> everyone also knew that Jesse had come to Virginia from her home in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and was a loyal Unionist. Jesse realized the severity of Ensign's wounds and his weakened state, and she was confident that the best she could do was provide a warm, dry place for Ensign to die. The following day, Wednesday, when the dead wagon came by, Jesse directed the soldiers into where Ensign's pallet was on the floor, and she was shocked to see beads of sweat on his brow. After sipping some watered-down whiskey, we assume it was watered down, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> Smith was able to speak. And Jessie focused all of her nursing abilities on that tenacious northerner. On the 26th of May, the Berkshire County Eagle carried the tragic news of the calamity of Siegel's defeat at Newmarket, which no one expected. Listed among the dead, reported the paper, was Corporal Ensign M. Smith. Company K, 34th Massachusetts of Dalton. Ensign's fiance Lucy was devastated. Ensign's uncle started the thousand mile round trip journey down to Virginia to reclaim the body and bring him back to the graveyard, the burial ground of his ancestors. Arriving at the Virginia Maryland line, the uncle was told that Newmarket can't be reached. It's in enemy hands. And the uncle returned home. Early in June, the Smith family held a funeral for their son. Oh. On the 21st of June, the family received a letter, a letter postmarked Newmarket, Virginia. 
Jesse was writing to inform the family that her son, their son, was still, in fact, very much alive and in her care. Ensign was even strong enough to scribble a line to confirm this too good to be true assertion. It was not all good news. The letter also stated that soon he would be so well that he would be turned over to Confederate authorities and be sent to a prison camp in the Deep South. Ensign, in fact, was sent to Harrisonburg, Virginia. There, it's about 20 miles just to the south of Newmark, it's still in the Shenandoah Valley. There, somehow he makes good his escape. It's possible that it was because Ensign was a Mason, as were so uh, many of the Virginians, many, many of, 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 uh, of the Confederates. And there might have been an exchange of acknowledgement of that fact. And the Confederate guard simply looked this way while Ensign went that way. We don't know how he made good his escape, but so he does. And over the next two weeks, in a hot Virginia August, he slowly made his way on foot 100 miles northwest through the mountains of West Virginia. And I can tell you that even in a car today, it's not easy to make your way through West Virginia. Those mountains and ravines and valleys. And I won't share with you any of our West Virginia jokes that Virginians love to tell. <laughs> but uh, once he reached the Maryland line, behind Union lines, Smith was furloughed and convalescence leave followed and he heads by rail back to Massachusetts, back to Dalton. The joyous reunion can only be imagined, but it was reported officially in the Bar Berkshire Eagle on the 15th of September. And everyone in town crowded around Smith and asked him over and over to tell this story of, of the soldier who had come back from the dead. It's not easy, it's not difficult either to imagine that Lucy was the most joyous among them all. It only took 10 days for Lucy to convince Ensign that now was the time and a wedding took place and <laughs> Lucy Branch became Mrs. Ensign Smith. Officially with certificate of identifying the fact. Uh, but Ensign's work was not done. You would think maybe, maybe he would stay a woodsman in his farm there in Dalton. But he rejoins the regiment. He returns this time as a courier because he can no longer serve as an infantryman because of his, his, his wounds. And he serves through Appomattox. The 31st, 4th would be there at Appomattox. And finally, he returns to Lucy. They named their firstborn son Rupert in honor of the woman who had saved Ensign's life. Death finally does come to claim Ensign as he lays quietly in his bed in his home in Dalton in 1904. Now with the return of peace, Jesse Rupert became a lecturer traveling throughout the North, speaking frequently on her experiences as a Unionist in wartime Virginia. She visited the veterans of the 34th whenever her travels brought her to Massachusetts. In fact, she often stayed with the Smith family. And when she died in 1909, members of the 34th helped purchase a suitable stone for her. She's buried in the Newmarket Lutheran Cemetery in the shadow of that great Massanutten Mountain. Her stone lovingly notes her title, Daughter of the Regiment, it says. Daughter of the Regiment. 34th Massachusetts Infantry. What a marker for these brave men of the 34th to have that there. After the war, Liza Kleindienst married John Krim, a Newmarket resident, and supported herself as a milliner. And for the remainder of her life, which was quite long, in fact, she lived well into her 90s, she maintained a close friendship with the many of the cadets for whom she had provided comfort in that third week of May in 1864. She also is buried in the Lutheran Cemetery just east of Newmarket. And her grave marker, provided by the VMI alumni, carries the inscription, Mother of the Newmarket Cadets. These two angels of mercy today lie in graves literally just a few feet from one another, not as far away as the width of this room. 
Cadet Moses Ezekiel returned to VMI and graduated in 1866. Moving to Rome, Italy, he became a world-renowned sculptor, knighted by several heads of state of European <laughs> nations. You can tell he's a sculptor. He's either a sculptor or a baker. Uh, I, I know for sure he, he may have done some baking, but I know for sure he was a sculptor. Just five years after the battle, think of this, just five years, how does war change us, you veterans? How, how does war change us? You don't come back the same, even if it's good. You're, you've been changed by this brotherhood, <coughs> by this experience. Five years after the Battle of New Market, in 1869, while Ezekiel is still a student of sculpture, studying in Berlin, Germany, he sculpts a statue that he calls Virginia, mourning her dead. The very same arms that had held the dying Thomas Jefferson descendant of the president, is now sculpting this statue almost as if it's a, uh, an emotional outpouring of that moment five years earlier. Now when VMI contacted their famous sculptor to produce a statue to commemorate the cadet role at the Battle of Newmarket, Ezekiel simply wrote them back and says, I've already done that. I did it 30 years ago. <laughs> and he offers up the statue, Virginia mourning her dead. And in 1904, the heroic allegorical statue, bronze, on its pedestal, was dedicated on the VMI post. Six of the ten cadets who died in the battle are buried in the shadow of that statue. It's fitting that Thomas Jefferson is among them. I mentioned at the beginning one of the ways in which this place, this new market, this Bushong farm, this wheat field, this field of lost shoes, this orchard, how they still are reflected and taught to the cadets entering, whether they enter from Massachusetts or Louisiana, they are told their family story that I am sharing with you. But there's another significant way. Every May the 15th, the anniversary date of the battle, the VMI Cadet Corps forms up and conducts a moving ceremony across the parade ground in front of the VMI barracks where Jim lived, where I lived, where Ezekiel lived, where Thomas lived, where George C. Marshall lived, where Richard Byrd lived, where Chesty Puller lived, on and on. And at that statue, there's a wreath, a wreath is laid. There's a, a, a rifle salute. Taps is played. And then the names of the ten cadets who died are solemnly called out. And each name echoes across the parade ground and off into the Shenandoah Valley. Cabell, Stannard, McDowell, Wheelwright, Jones, Atwill, Hayes, Crockett, Hartsfield, and Jefferson. And a cadet responds for each name as it's called out. Died on the field of honor, sir. But it's not only those ten who are remembered on that solemn occasion. We also recognize the over 600 VMI alumni, citizen soldiers, who have died in times of war since the founding of the Institute in 1839. This tiny little school giving such treasure <coughs> to the nation. You see, that orchard and that wheat field around Jacob Bushong's farm have become more than it appears to be. It's not just another battlefield in Virginia. That we feel is now the, a muddy trench of the Somme, or the sands of Normandy, or a ri rice paddy in Vietnam, or a mountaintop in Afghanistan. That's the experience of all of these names you see. The battlefield at Newmarket is a constant reminder to the VMI Cadet Corps of all of those places, and in fact <coughs> places yet to be named, where they, young men that are in the Corps this very day, those 22 Massachusetts who are in the Corps today, may be called, places yet unnamed. America has grown to expect this from its VMI alumni, and well, it should. We are America's school of the citizen soldier. So this connection between us, between you and me, between that field and that field, what is that connection? When the VMI Museum was established, the founding superintendent, this guy Francis Henny Smith, uh, 
he wanted a place where service and sacrifice and commitment and duty was physically embodied by veterans, by particularly he was thinking veterans of the American Revolution. Because you see at that time in the 1830s what's happening? Even the oldest of the veterans are passing away. And soon there would be no one that says, yes, I stood out there on that green, I served with George Washington, there would be no one left that could personally say that. Where will America's Minutemen come from tomorrow? Where will America's citizen soldiers come from tomorrow, they were asking in 1830. And part of the answer is, is in this picture. Citizen soldiers whose inspiration, whose very reason for being the founding of VMI itself goes right back to that little patch of green out there. Thank you very much. We do need you to uh, speak into the mic for your questions. So who would like to go first? Make them easy, please. Uh, <laughs> don't be shy. All right, sir, you're first. The first person to answer a question, ask That's a question. Nice. And you may have to answer it. Too. Oh, no, it's going to be the second person. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. John. 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 Um, this is related to your expertise, not exactly new market that's why i hesitate a little but i've got to tap you while you're here but first of all thank you so much that was phenomenal presentation and the audio visual one good thing about technology it's just <laughs> incredible the way you uh, integrate it with your talk i read a uh, really uh, great biography of stonewall jackson called rebel yell by s c Gwynn a yep, couple years yep, ago yep, yep, yep. yeah i liked it so much i read it again this last summer and uh Regardless of where you got, I'm a, I'm a damn Yankee. <laughs> blue and blue, if the war's fought today, I, you know, I'd be fighting from, I grew up in this area, but you, I just can't help respecting that Stonewall Jackson must have been one of our most effective tactical generals that we've ever seen. Uh, with that said, my question is, one of my best friends from the Air Force, his son graduated from VMI a little less than 10 years ago. And when I bring that up to JT, that's his son's name, about how my readings have taught me about Stonewall Jackson, he gave me ambivalent uh, feedback on how the cadet corps, and the kids coming through via VMI, not necessarily were taught, but what their vibe was on Stonewall, and it, it, it confuses me. Yeah. <coughs> That's not really a question. Um, <laughs> help me out with my confusion about uh, why they might feel that way about Stonewall, please. I, I, it is something we're thinking a great deal about. Uh, of course, all of you have read about how we're really sort of, in the South, we're rethinking a, a lot of our monuments to Confederate heroes, uh, certainly people of courage, uh, and, and the role that they might properly play in the future. And prominent among them is a statue. You can actually see it in this picture right there. That's the statue that you're referring to. Stonewall Jackson standing right in front of the barracks as a general officer. Now, Sam, the book that you refer to, uh, Rebel Yell, uh, Sam is a, a friend, and we've gone to lunch, and we've debated his thesis. Uh, and I told him that I'm not sure I quite agree with your premise. Sam Gwen's premise in this book, which is, he's a great writer and, and good researcher, but his premise is he's writing a series of books on Americans that have been transformational. People that in a moment of need have risen up and become somebody that the moment needed. I, and I can see how, and he makes a good argument to that for Tom Jackson. But I would suggest to you, as I've suggested to him to no avail, but <laughs> I would suggest to you that Jackson had already become that person. You can look at his career in the Mexican-American where he graduates from West Point in 1846 
immediately goes into the artillery and goes down to Mexico and is breveted for his bravery and his innovation with artillery. <coughs> He's already showing those kinds of uh, initiatives that are going to make him so su successful and effective in the American Civil War. I believe the American Civil War, regardless of what uniform Jackson is wearing, uh, if his native state had gone with Virginia, Jackson might have been in with that Union <coughs> artillery at, at uh, New Market. But, uh, uh, but the point is, is that the Civil War gave Jackson a much grander theater, a grander stage on which to demonstrate his genius. And he begins to be followed around the world in England, in Germany, in France, the newspapers are writing about Jackson becomes the first great hero long before anybody ever knew Robert E. Lee was. <coughs> People are following Jackson and his, his movements in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, the bizarreness of his accidental wounding and death by his own men, etc. It's, it's, a, it's a Hollywood film. Uh, the, the, so that if you, if you were to write at this moment, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but if you were to take out your phones and Google top 100 most uh, important military commanders of all times, from Genghis Khan to right today, the top 100, the, the list varies because historians can't agree on you know, anything, but the list will vary. But you will find General Thomas Jackson on that list, number 38, number 45, number... Uh, uh, 39, number 42, right in the solid center of the top 100 most important commanders of all time. Well, at a place like VMI, that's, that's merit enough to pay him tribute and to study him. And the fact that we have this personal relationship with him, and as much as he was a, a professor that taught in a classroom right over here for 10 years before the coming of war, uh, creates a relationship, a bond with him. And that's why the statue is there. In fact, the statue was done by Moses Ezekiel, that guy that I've been talking about, in 1912. Now, the cadets today do not necessarily come to VMI because of an interest in Civil War history. They become because they want to go to one of the top five public, uh, small, liberal arts colleges in the nation, where VMI is always ranked right there in the top five. The others are West Point, the Naval Academy, and I forget the others, they're not important. But, but <laughs> we're there in the top five. You know, it is a demanding, rigorous academic program. It's not all about marching like this. Uh, it's about producing electrical engineers that, that go off to serve the country. Uh, all sorts of uh, 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 careers. The, so their interest varies and, and what their commitment, what their, what their awareness, what their knowledge of, is of a Stonewall Jackson. Uh, now we feel we have a solid uh, rationale as to why this statue of all of those that might be considered Confederate statues subject to be removed and, or relocated, we feel that we have a compelling argument as to why that statue should stay right where it is. Uh, and to m more or lesser degrees, the cadets are exposed to it. They are, get a, an awareness of it. But their interest may not be what ours might have been when we were growing up, quite, quite honestly. It's a complicated issue. Good, good question. Keith. Yes, oh, I mean, yes sir. Uh, could you tell us what uh, happened to General Siegel after this war? Well, General Siegel... Uh, is relieved to command within two weeks. Uh, a new fellow comes in to take his place, uh, and his name is David Hunter. General David Hunter will uh, continue the campaign. Uh, he gets to Lexington. He totally destroys this building very efficiently, uh, totally destroys VMI, continues on over to Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, in the central section of the state, where there will be a major... Uh, 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 resistance to his uh, movement any further and the Battle of Lynchburg. The cadets, in fact, participate in it. Uh, 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 David Hunter is repulsed there and moves out of the theater over into West Virginia and kind of wanders around over there for a, a while uh, and then gets involved in uh, 
uh, political debates, basically, in Washington, D.C. He's removed from command, and he challenges the hierarchy and, at, the, at the War Department about his, his fitness for command, and it just gets just all bogged down. Eventually, he's going to serve on the commission that will be the uh, jury and the judge for the uh, Lincoln assassins, uh, and he will quietly die eventually in Washington, D.C. Yes, sir. Uh, I spent a couple of years living in Virginia, and on two on two occasions, I happened to visit the battle uh, reenactment in Manassas. Oh yes, right. Okay, where two battles occurred. Uh, I didn't get the occasion to visit VMI. My question is, do you have any knowledge of whether VMI? participated in that Battle of Manassas? In a very, that was the first, Manassas, there are two battles there, as, as, as Jake says. The first one is the great land battle of the Civil War. It's gonna, it's gonna be like the uh, Super Bowl. It's gonna determine who the victor is. This is one battle. Uh, and it's gonna take place outside of Washington, D.C. And it's gonna be quite an event. And the congressmen come out in their carriages and have picnics, you know, and they're gonna watch the <laughs> troops move around. Uh, this is how naive we were uh, as, a, as, as, as a nation, uh, on both sides, quite <coughs> frankly. But the Confederates were absolutely green. They hadn't experienced, they hadn't seen the elephant, as they would refer to it. They hadn't been in battle, none of them. Well, <coughs> had been in Mexico. but. So the cadet corps had been called out in the spring, summer of 1861 to actually be uh, drill instructors in Richmond to train the troops that will ultimately fight the Battle of Manassas. <clears throat> and some of them had gone to outside of Manassas and still serving in that capacity as drill instructors. And their men were so impressed with them and they said, we want you to stay with us. You know, we want you to lead us in this coming battle. And several of the cadets do that. And two of the cadets are killed there in the first land, wearing their cadet uniforms. One is named Charles Norris. And if you go to the Manassas Battlefield Visitor Center, in the very center of their exhibit area is a VMI cadet coatee, virtually identical to every one of those you see there with its 42 brass buttons, which used to be made in Waterbury, uh, just down the road a few, few Miles or so. uh, but the uniform is almost identical to this one uh, that the Corps still wears today. And it has, it's different because it has a big hole in the chest right here that took the life of Charles Norris there at that very first battle. So yes, they were present. Okay. Right here. May, oh yes. May yes, I Charles. ask, I know uh, just a detail. First of all, thanks for a great talk. Good, thank you. Um, you mentioned that the uh, cadets were armed with Austrian muskets. May I ask which model and how did they get the VMI? <laughs> well, let's see. Which model? Was it the 54? Does that make sense? 18, 1854 or 52? It, it, was a, it was an old surplus model that the Austrians were gladly selling us. Uh, but it was considered a third level arm. Uh, if you really wanted something from Springfield was what you wanted. But if you had to have not if you couldn't get something from Springfield, well, maybe one of those British infields would do just as well. But if you couldn't get that, well, then you got an Austrian musket. And that's what the cadets uh, were, uh, were armed with in, in the Battle uh, of, uh, of Newmarket. We have a couple of them in our collection today. Uh, but uh, 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 they had been sent up to VMI just a matter of a couple of months, in fact, before the battle. So it was just the best they had. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Can you say something about uh, how people in the South uh, uh, are taking the uh, uh, suggestion that they ought to get rid of uh, these statues that, uh, that they have from uh, the Civil War, Civil well, War heroes? Well, there's a lot of, uh, of, of uh, reflection, a lot of heated debate going on about that topic. Uh, it seems like the... The, cons the general thought is that it should be decisions made on the local basis. If the local community decides that it no longer wants the Confederate statue on the lawn of the courthouse, if they decide against that, then it, it is appropriate to remove it, maybe place it in a museum or something, uh, or they may choose to retain it there. 
So it's becoming more of a local issue as opposed to a blanket uh, edict that will come out of Richmond or wherever. Uh, uh, the, my position early on in this, uh, this discussion, and I think it's very important to be having the discussion, we really do need to be thinking about what does this history mean to us? Uh, what is it? We're looking for useful history, history that will help us prepare for the future. So, um, I've been under the impression that we, to take down all the Confederate statues is probably will turn out to be a disservice. Other countries have tried similar things and with not great success. Uh, but why don't we contextualize them? Why don't we explain why that Confederate monument got put there, when it was, and all of that? And it'll help us understand this really complex world that the past was. That's one of the things, not as a declaration, but subtly, I was trying to do in this talk. How complicated their lives were. Every bit as complicated as ours. Uh, it was life and death, love, struggle, commitment. You know, all of those things that we cherish and pride, we can find in their lives. In fact, we have it because they had it. We have inherited it, literally. So. I would prefer to see contextualization leaving the statues for the most part where they are. Some may have no connection with where they are, so take those down. Uh, others could possibly better serve by having a, 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 an interpretive sign explaining more about them. Uh, clearly, we will overreach. Statues will be taken down for no reason, simply to make someone feel good, uh, and maybe 15 years from now, the statue will go back up uh, because the pendulum swings. Uh, but that's where we are at the moment. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion. Ah, would, you, would you hand this mic over to Bob on the end? Okay, well, I've been trying to figure out how to phrase this since, since the beginning of your talk. Um, first of all, Confederate statues were put up during Reconstruction, which most Americans don't understand what Reconstruction yes, is. Yes, right. It is when, after, somewhat after the Civil War, in the late 1800s, um, segregation was reinstituted in a very horrible, brutal way all through the South. So those statues, as far as I can tell, are not really statues to the Civil War. They are statues to the reinstitution of really horrible mistreating and segregation. Um, the question I had actually from the beginning was, and, I, and I, I will say I am not a veteran. I appreciate that you all let me be here, and I enormously appreciate the sacrifices and, and all that you all have made. Um, my question actually is in the beginning when I saw cadets there now in the present day, and this relates to your, your museum as well, um, I saw people, I mean, a, a reenactor in Confederate uniforms as well as Union. Um, in a world, in, in a country where we are dealing still with horrible segregation as a result of slavery, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it would seem to me that you all have a, a golden opportunity to take a whole lot of young, impressionable people and people who visit a museum to have them understand that even though individuals may have been very brave, that the cause that they were fighting for was a rebellion against the United States of America <laughs> and in favor of slavery and horrible mistreatment of human beings. So my question is, how seriously do you all take that and, yeah. and what do you do for both the cadets and people who visit the museum? Well, you know, it, it, so much in, 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 your, in your statement uh, that, uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the, it is, it's, a, it is a, it's a fabrication to say that the, the war was not fought over slavery. Absolutely, it was fought over the preservation of slavery. Uh, states' rights, well, states' rights for what? States' rights to determine whether or not they wish to continue slavery. Uh, it was core, it was fundamental to, to that experience, to the culture of the time. Uh, the moving beyond the war, and there were, I think, well, I, I there, 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 there's many, 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 many examples uh, of uh, uh, former Confederates saying they were really relieved with the outcome. It's the only possible outcome that made any sense. The, the leaving the Union uh, was actually 
And this is something, you know, historians debate, you know, and will continue to debate. Leaving the Union initially was a constitutional right or something that no one had ever even thought. Gosh, suppose somebody wants to leave. Well, there wasn't any constitution saying you can leave the Union. It said exactly how to get there. So how do you leave the Union? You sort of reverse those steps, and then you're out. It, 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 was, it was not, in fact, a civil war as we think of civil wars today because it wasn't anyone's idea that we were going to go take over Washington. When I say we, Virginia, North Carolina, you know, the South, was going to go take over Washington and, and institute our own policies in Washington. That would have been civil war. The idea was, in fact, many of them referred to it as this. It's the second war for independence. We were doing what those guys in 1776 had done uh, in their own time, 80 years earlier. We were declaring independence from a sovereign that we thought maybe was not acting in their best interest as they saw it. Uh, were they right about that? Uh, I, I can't support that they were. So then what happens? Well, the John, Jim Crow era in which you speak was the great tragedy, I think, Slavery is the initial sin, let's say. Slavery is the original sin. But the great tragedy of all of this effort of the Civil War and beyond was the era of Jim Crow. Now, uh, I do believe you're absolutely right that some of these statues are being put up in that era as a very visible showing of white supremacy. I think that has to be acknowledged. It's true. Some, Not all or, some or all? Not all of them, but some were. Uh, I certainly don't, I, oh, shucks, unable to connect to the box. I, I don't think that one was, for example, but we can all make our separate individual arguments for various statues. Uh, but they are symbols on the landscape of that era. Now, why is it also happening at that time? Because the old veterans of the 34th or wherever they might have been, the 54th Pennsylvania, the 62nd Virginia, wherever they were, they were aging and dying off. And the, their communities, north and south, wish to recognize those old veterans and putting up their monuments. And it's really, a, it's, it's a not, we, we have to acknowledge too that even quite often we in the south are, 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 are amusingly criticized gently uh, that, you know, we, we're still fighting the war down there. You know, we haven't given up on that, you know, and all, all of this. Uh, you can go to virtually any little hamlet in New Hampshire or Massachusetts and find a monument to the brave boys that left this community to fight in the Civil War. In fact, there's a Confederate cannon down here in the Lexington mm. Municipal Building, uh, a, a gift of the United States government in 1878. Uh, 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 so it, it truly, uh, it's more... We don't have to go very far to see places that were directly impacted by it that are still uh, uh, scars on the countryside. Uh, so it, it, in that sense, it's a more, it's a greater presence for us. Uh, I think the very points that you bring up are the very legitimate kinds of things that we have to confront and discuss uh, as a nation and say, then what? Now, where do we go? Uh, and I appreciate you, you mentioning it. I, I guess part of the question is, what are you doing now to help the VMI cadets, who are very young, okay. impressionable yeah. young people, to um, understand, hopefully understand, that racism still exists, oh, yeah. it's horrible, yeah, yeah. and not glorify the other, and also what's happening in your museum in, trying, in terms of trying to explain things in, in how we now see things. That's constantly something, constantly something, and you're right, I'm sorry, I, I forgot, that, I mean, that is constantly something that we're reviewing in our educational programming and activities uh, that go on. Uh, and just as the National Park Service takes the position that here are the facts as best we 